the, the biggest mystery that we deal with in developmental uh, biology is the embryo or the zygote starts out as a single cell. And as the cells start undergoing mitosis, as they start undergoing morphogenesis, where they move around one another, how do you start getting certain cells turning on some genes and other gels, uh, cells turning on other genes? That is the big mystery in the things that we study in the development of any particular organism. Again, the secret to this is understanding that even the cytoplasm of the stem cell is not uniform. So you, a lot of times we, we have this hard time to, to understand how when two cells become one, you say, oh, that's half the embryo, this is the other half of the embryo, as it is in the case of the frog or the xenopus. But if you know and understand that there's already proteins, and RNA, and all sorts of things that have been shifted around to all sorts of different areas in the cytoplasm, then it starts easier to understand how one cell can start becoming hundreds of cells and how those individual cells can start turning on different types of genes. Uh, then it's very clear to understand that. Okay, so one of the most difficult things, and this is a graduate cl level class that I took called eukaryotic gene regulation. One of the most difficult things to understand is eukaryotic gene regulation. It is nowhere near as simple as prokaryotic gene regulation, where they have things like the lac operon and uh, uh, other things that are very simplistic in terms of how they respond to the environment. When you deal with human cells as well as most other eukaryotic cells, there are so many levels of control within the cell as far as turning genes on, turning genes off, when they get turned on, Sometimes you can even make, go through the whole process of making a protein, and then the protein is just chewed up at the end. You know, I mean, it's, it, it's kind of fascinating to say, well, it expends all this energy to make these proteins only to just kill them in the end. So you ask the question, well, why? Why does it generate so much energy to do so? Well, we've answered those things in that there are times where it needs the protein ready at a moment's notice. And at a stage in development, then it stops destroying that protein, and immediately the protein can be active and start doing what it needs to do. So there are some just fascinating things we're going to go through and various examples of this type of activation and repression and control. So here are the four levels of control that a cell has in a eukaryotic cell to determine whether a gene is transcribed, then whether it is moved out of the nucleus for translation, then whether or not it's translated, and then whether or not the protein gets used after that point. Those are the four steps. Again, gene, gene transcription. Transcription is the process of copying the DNA to the RNA. The next one, selective nuclear RNA processing. Not all RNA leaves the nucleus. It must be modified. This is where we're going to talk about introns and exons and, uh, you know, the, uh, the capping of the RNA, the polyadenylation, all of these factors that go into preparing the RNA so that it can even leave the nucleus to be translated. Selective messenger RNA translation. Then you get the point where even though the RNA leaves the nucleus, it might not be translated right away. Maybe it gets pushed off to a particular side of the cytoplasm and just waits, as is the case with certain um, organisms, for example, Drosophila, or the fruit fly, they create massive amounts of messenger RNA, and they just move them to opposite ends of the oocyte, and then at a certain stage of development, then it initiates translation. So just because the RNA is made doesn't mean it's going to be translated right away. So that's selective messenger RNA translation. And then the last and most important, post-translational modification. Not all proteins are, are ready to go as soon as they're made. There's folding, there's cutting that needs to be done. There is other things, factors that need to come into play to even make them functional. You've got, you know, prosthetic groups that need to be added to them. There's a whole list of things that get done. So this is why I spent an entire freaking uh, semester on just these four principles alone. And all of these right here, these five concepts, are mechanisms of gene transcription regulation, which is a huge endeavor to understand, especially for eukaryotic uh, organisms. Let's start with activation and repression of the chromatin itself. So let's look at the structure of DNA. The DNA is organized 
uh, where it's wrapped around these histone proteins, and, and which allows the DNA not only to be, you know, uh, uh, have an affinity for the chromatin, but it also, or the uh, histones, but it also allows the cell to regulate whether or not the DNA is transcribed. Now, one of the biggest qualifiers for uh, the ability for, for the cells to transcribe it is it must remove that affinity to the histones, okay? So the chromatin, we call this chromatin remodeling, okay? Chromatin remodeling is the process that a cell uses to open up, as we call it, or allow access to the DNA so that it can be transcribed into RNA and then eventually translated. So there's a number of mechanisms. In fact, some things can be done to the chromatin or to the histones themselves. Other things are done to the DNA itself. And in fact, sometimes they can do both. Let's talk about chromatin modification. Methylation, acetylation, deacetylation. These are things that allow the chromatin to be loosened up because DNA and chromatin, or DNA and the histones have an affinity for one another to form chromatin. When you methylate, demethylate, acetylate, deacetylate, again, methyl groups is like a carbon and, and hydrogen and whatnot. Here's a, a, an example of how methylation occurs. It's just the adding of a carbon and three hydrogens or whatnot. Acetylation, acetyls are a little bit more complex. It's carbon, three hydrogens, and then kind of a carbon dioxide here as well. Um, are chemical groups that are used to change the properties of chromatin. So you have methylation, you have acetylation, uh, you even have phosphorylation. We're not going to focus too much on phosphorylation right now. So acetylation and methylation, let's talk about that. Because a cell can either uh, do this to the histones or it can do it to the actual DNA. So here is the general concept of how it works. If you add methyl groups to a histone, then you turn it off. If you take away a methyl group from a histone or from the DNA, then you turn it on. So that's what the negative means. If you remove methyl groups from the actual DNA itself or from the histones, that then allows transcription to be turned on. Now, in the case of demethylating uh, histones, it loosens up the DNA to allow the uh, polymerase and the transcription factors to essentially copy the DNA. DNA itself can be methylated as well, whereas these methyl groups are actually stuck right on top of the DNA and they prevent the polymerase and the transcription factors from transcribing the gene. So again, to add methyl groups to either the histones or the um, uh, DNA itself turns transcription off. If you remove them, it turns it on. So that's one method of control. The second one's the opposite. When you add acetyl groups to the, uh, the histones, it actually turns transcription on. It causes the DNA to uh, uh, be loosened from around the histones, less affinity for the histones themselves, and it allows the, the uh, then transcription factors and, and uh, polymerase and whatnot to transcribe the genes. Okay? So deacetylation, or the removal of acetyl groups, does the opposite. It turns transcription off. So these are the kind of fundamental mechanisms of actually manipulating the, the, the chromatin itself to turn things on and to turn things off. In fact, one of the most fascinating things about uh, uh, methylation is this can be inherited. If you've ever heard of genomic imprinting, genomic imprinting is the process where due to what you and I are exposed to, we end up shutting genes off by methylating them. Well, this methylation is actually inherited from father to son and from mother to daughter. Now, why do I say father, son, mother to daughter? Well, here's the fascinating thing. When I create my gametes, I erase all of the imprints that my mother gave me and I re-imprint them as my father gave them to me. Women do the opposite. They erase all the imprints that their fathers gave them and they re-imprint their gametes as their mothers gave them as far as the methylation. Pretty fascinating. So this is what's called genomic imprinting. It's not mutating the DNA. It's not changing the genetic code at all. All it's doing is regulating certain genes that can be turned off um, 
almost permanently sometimes, and then that gets passed on. So your environment or what you're exposed to can actually have a, a, an effect upon um, the next generation in terms of your genetics. That's one of the many mechanisms that can be used for uh, activating and, and, and turning off genes. Well, let's look at some other ways of, of how we can regulate gene transfer. So that's activation and repression of chromatin. Exons and introns, this is biology 101, so to speak, or 1010, as we have it here. But let's go over some of the basics again. When a gene is transcribed, it's not fully done. So what parts of that gene actually become the messenger RNA that will eventually be translated? The exons, okay? So each gene has a certain number of introns and exons. Again, we have somewhere between 20 to 25,000 genes in the human genome. How many proteins, just off the top of your head, do you think we make of, uh, uh, collectively amongst all the cells in our body? How many proteins do you think we can make because of the ability to splice different exons and intron combinations and remove introns and have certain exons come out and others not, so on and so forth. Somewhere around 400,000. 400,000 variations of the 20 to 25,000 genes that we have that can be what we call alternatively spliced. So exon and introns. This gets into what we call RNA splicing, where once the RNA is made, Again, it removes various introns. It can either remove huge sections of them. It can you know, recombine the genetics. Just a fascinating process of control. So even, and again, it comes down to some of the genes that are already being uh, uh, made that determines how the, the RNA is going to be spliced. In one cell, it might be spliced one way. In another cell, it might be spliced a completely different way, depending upon their history. So again, you can transcribe the same gene between two, and we have what are called isoforms. Isoforms are slight variations of the same protein. We're finding these subforms of proteins. We may initially we thought, hey, you know, they're all forming the same transcription factor. No, there's Pax 3A and Pax 3B and Pax 3C and Pax 3D, and gosh, it's just freaking amazing. All right, so there is a lot of control, exons and introns, in terms of how uh, the gene ultimately gets spliced. We make hundreds of thousands of variations with just 20 to 25,000 templates. To, to give you a contrast, C. elegans, which are um, a worm that we study in development, they have 30,000 genes. You want to know how many proteins they make? 30,000. <laughs> they don't splice their genes, essentially. They only make as many proteins as they typically have genes. They don't have the type of control that you and I have in our cells, which greatly increases our complexity. Okay, so what, you're end up, what you end up with, again, is just a series of exons that have the start and the stop codon, the termination codon, all of the codons in between. They have the leader sequence that's used in the translation process itself, and they have the tail sequence. The RNA will not leave the nucleus until it is capped and until it receives its poly A tail. It gives the RNA its Lifetime. It tells the cell how long the RNA is going to survive. And that's how the cell will predetermine whether it's going to be out for half an hour or an hour or two hours or whatever the case may be. So poly A provides stability in determining how long the RNA is going to survive. That's kind of its timer for its death, so to speak. And then the five prime cap, what's that for? It comes out of the nucleus. It needs to be capped before it can exit the nuclear pore complex to be able to go out to where the ribosomes are at, okay? Now, promoters and enhancers. Promoters are those sequences, such as the TATA box and, and uh, other uh, DNA sequences, that are a form of gene transcription regulation. Now, what the promoters typically do are, they're found just before the transcription of the gene, and they're necessary in order for the uh, uh, gene to be able to be transcribed. What happens is you have these transcription factors, as we call them, that must bind to the promoter site before transcription can occur. Ultimately, you need not just the polymerase, but you need a conglomeration of factors. Now, these factors, if they're not present, you will not get transcription of these genes. 
So one of the things that you're going to hear and see throughout this entire semester is transcription factors. Why? Because transcription factors play a huge role on whether or not genes are turned on at certain cells at certain times in certain areas of development. In fact, my entire PhD was spent on one freaking transcription factor and determining its role and what genes it turned on at a particular stage of development. It's kind of sad that I can sum up four years of my life in a sentence, but um, <laughs> that's the nature of this. So um, promoters are these DNA regions that have an affinity for certain proteins, which we call transcription factors. Now, these transcription factors must be present in the nucleus for these genes to be turned on. How do they get in the nucleus? Well, this is the process we're going to discuss throughout the semester, is that they respond to external stimuli, and when these stimuli do certain things, they allow these transcription factors to come into the nucleus, and then the gene transcription occurs. So without these transcription factors, you may have all of the other elements you may have everything ready to go, and you're missing that one piece, and it will not transcribe the gene until that last piece is there. Once it's there, then it'll start transcribing the gene, and then you've got to get over the next three hurdles that we're talking about to even make the protein, if that's the case. Okay? So, so what's the difference between a promoter and an enhancer? Well, a promoter is that region that is necessary to form the polymerase complex to actually transcribe uh, the, uh, the gene itself. So an enhancer, if you think of something being enhanced, it will enhance how often that gene is transcribed. It basically regulates the rate of transcription. So enhancers can actually make it so that lots and lots of genes are transcribed at a particular point. As we'll show, there, there are different levels of intensity of protein that actually gets made. And the enhancers play a role in this in determining how much, how much RNA is transcribed and as a result, how much protein is actually made as a result of that. Now, one of the fascinating things about enhancers, they don't always have to be right next to the promoters. They can actually be way downstream genetically of the gene itself. How is that possible? How can an enhancer influence a gene that's thousands of nucleotides upstream on that chromosome. Chromosomes don't just stay linear, they bend and can actually come back and, and uh, influence these genes. So the enhancers typically are found on, uh, on the chromosomes of the genes that they regulate, and they can be down from the gene or they can be up from the gene, but there is a certain element of folding of the DNA that it can come back on itself to enhance the transcription of that gene. Okay, so that's promoters and enhancers. As I said, transcription factors. These are the proteins that initiate transcription. They're the ones that sit on the promoters and form this huge complex that I used to know all the elements of, and it's just kind of busy work, so I'm not going to have you do it, um, that ultimately is necessary to have the polymerase be able to transcribe the DNA into RNA. So that you definitely keep in mind, transcription factors. We're going to talk quite a bit about all the various transcription factors. Now, one of the last regulatory elements of, we're still only on the first one, of uh, genes, of how they're transcription, there are regions of DNA which we call silencers. Now, silencers are um, uh, regions that can bind protein and ultimately prevent transcription of a gene. And in many cases, this is good because you only want genes transcribed in certain cells at certain times. Here is a process called an in situ hybridization. The purple, everything where you're seeing the purple, this is a chemical reaction where they've turned a chemical uh, into a precipitate. And only where this gene is being transcribed do you see the purple uh, um, thing. So this other region that's yellow and, and white and whatnot, there's no gene transcription there. However, if they strip all of the genetics of the embryo of this silencer, look what happens. The gene gets expressed everywhere. So silencers are necessary to control because uh, sometimes there are elements that may want to cause the gene to be transcribed, and there are other elements that can repress that. 
in cells. So, you know, it's not just down to promoters and enhancers. There's also things that say, hey, no, you're not supposed to transcribe this gene in this uh, cell. There are proteins that will sit down here and prevent genes from being transcribed in all these other tissues because it only needs to be transcribed in these particular cells due to their fate. Uh, one, there's one more element. It's called insulators. So insulators are uh, parts of your DNA that will bind protein because one of the, the, the hardest things is that the genes being so close together, there can be some possible overlap of signals. And so enhancers and promoters uh, or enhancers may cause other genes to be um, transcribed when they shouldn't be. And so the insulators, just like in, you know what insulation is, prevent other elements of the DNA from influencing that region. Okay? So insulators are also regions of the DNA that bind protein, that prevent kind of crosstalk between the genes, preventing gene transcription where it's not wanted. That. Here's just something showing you the, the kind of some chromatin remodeling. Here the white is the DNA that's been loosened due to acetylation uh, or uh, demethylation. Over here, you can kind of see it, it, it's in black. I know it's hard to see with this one, but it's wrapped around very tightly around these histones or whatnot. So chromatin throughout the whole genome, there are parts that are just shut off. And as a cell goes through its process, this is one of the main mechanisms of making sure that none of these other things can influence it. Basically, when you methylate a histone or deacetylate a histone, it prevents all of these other elements from occurring. It prevents the promoter and enhancer and transcription factors from influencing that DNA. So it's kind of the supreme regulatory mechanism because if the DNA is tightly wound around the histones, none of, this, none of the rest of the stuff will influence it. It has to be open, so to speak, or loose or uh, active in order for these other elements to be able to work on the DNA. All right. Now, similar, there's one more method that I want to explain. This is mainly in females. Um, it's chromosome inactivation. This is kind of taking an entire chromosome and inactivating the whole thing, creating what we call a bar body. Um, in human development, this happens with the second X chromosome in females, where essentially the entire chromosome just gets bound up um, to, to the point where only one X chromosome is active. Now, in the earliest stages of development, women need both X chromosomes. Men need an X and a Y, but there comes a point where you only need one X chromosome. I mean, look at men's genetics. We only have one X chromosome. So after a certain point, you don't need two X chromosomes anymore. So even though women have 46 chromosomes, randomly one of the X chromosomes becomes completely inactivated. It's still there. It still gets copied every time a cell um, goes through the process of replication. Um, however, only one is, is active in terms of transcription and the translation of its genes. So this happens not just in, in humans, but also in cats. This is actually where you get calico cats, where if on the two X chromosomes, um, whichever one gets inactivated and early on in development, the pigmentation for uh, um, their fur is on the X chromosome. Um, if, it, if the one with the orange gene, you know, the, the, the allele or whatnot, is suppressed, then the black will come up. If the one with the black is suppressed, then the orange will come up. You can have male calico cats, a cat that has two X chromosomes and a Y. It can do the same thing because it still inactivates one of its X chromosomes. So yeah, a Klinefelter syndrome cat, <laughs> it's possible. Um, so that's essentially what happens is early on in the formation of the cells and uh, in the inner cell mass, one of the X chromosomes randomly gets inactivated um, and it will still be transmitted from one generation to the next. It's just not going to be genetically active in terms of gene transcription. Oops. It's what we call bar body, essentially, a bar body complex. Okay, so that's on a large scale, and that typically only happens when, like in females with two X chromosomes. <laughs> 